All right, can everybody everybody hear me and can you see my uh, the presentation? Um, Cause I just wanna make sure everyone can hear and see me um, before I start so I don't have issues throughout it. All right, we're good, all right. So we'll just wait here about eh, 20 more seconds to 220. All right, so, um, so we'll get started. So uh, my name is Joseph Pennock. I am the team captain of FTC team 18457, the Gator Bites from Debray Park, California. Um, and so this presentation breakout session is going to be about um, how to design competitive drivetrains for use in FTC. Um, this is gonna be an overview. This was written before um, the game was released. It was written about a week ago and some things are slightly going to be changing because of just the differences that uh, we do see this season as far as um, movement and rules. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so what are some of the general requirements um, that we see for competitive FTC drivetrain? Um, so it can vary from team to team. Um, some teams value other things more than others and can get become a giant mess. Um, so I've compiled a short list of the four things that my team and my, I myself personally have found over the last few years to be kind of important to um, what our team tries to do. And that is speed, weight, size, and agility. And so speed, um, we'll start off. It's arguably one of the most important attributes for a drivetrain. Um, is it speed? Um, the faster drivetrain is, um, it can cycle faster, which means you score more points. Um, you can avoid defense that's being played uh, against you. Um, so that's also another huge upside. Um, weight weight kind of goes hand in hand with speed um, because the lighter dr dr drivetrain you have, um, you can have a higher gear or a lower gear ratio, which allows for your robot to go faster, um, which is always an upside. So those two kind of work together. Um, size, you generally want your robot and, and drivetrain to push its um, footprint perimeter to a 17 by and a half by 17 and a half inch cube. Um, that's half an inch under the 18 inch square. It just allows for tolerances and in inspection. So you don't fail inspection. And with that size, you have a lot of space to build game specific mechanisms on top of the robot. And agility, um, having an agile drivetrain is important. Um, it's at the bottom of the list because it can be you can be without it, but it is nice in some circumstances, um, such as navigating around objects, obstacles, or um, any defense that's being played against you. So once again, speed and agility also kind of go hand in hand. Um, so we'll move on. What are the different types of drivetrains? So we talk about drivetrains generally. Um, as far as the types go, there's two main different types. Um, that would be tank drive and holonomic drive. Um, both are, are commonly used in FTC and both require integration um, with software, hardware, and the rest of your robot um, to be used to their fullest potential. Um, there are 10 different subgroups of each of these. Um, so five for tank drive, five for holonomic drive. drive. And so we're gonna be going over those here in just a second. Um, but yeah, so the two main are tank drive and holonomic drive um, that are used. So tank drives, um, a tank drive is driven with uh, one or two motors on each side of the robot, driving one, two, three, or four wheels per side. Um, there are five common types of tank drives that make up what I would say is 99.9% .9 of the tank drives that we see in FTC. And that would be the two wheel drive, AKA push bot, the four wheel drive, six wheel drive, eight wheel drive, and tread drive. Um, the one thing about this tread drive, it is, um, it's one of the only pictures I can find. It's not very common. Um, they did use three motors on each side to power their treads just for that extra torque. So that is something that um, is slightly off from the one or two motors on each side um, idea. So when we move on to the two wheel drive, um, it's also known as a push bot. It's the most basic form of a drivetrain that we can we have in FTC. Um, 
And normally it has two traction wheels and two omni wheels, um, with the traction wheels being driven and the omni wheels being undriven. And these are either at the front or back. And so there are design limitations and it's not great. It is used, you can use it. My team was semi-successful with it first year. Um, on my first team, which was like two years ago, um, we were semi-successful using a um, tank drive or a push bot tank drive. Um, it's low traction. You don't have that much grip with only two wheels powered. You have limited options as far as design goes. Um, you have an off center pivot point, which means that when your robot rotates, the front or back is gonna swing more than the um, uh, the other the opposite end is just because of the design. Um, it is a simple design. So that does help for like newer builders and teams um, building a robot that's that they can compete with. Um, there's not gonna run into as many issues as far as um, engineering wise with the uh, uh, two wheel pushbot drive than it would with other drive trains. Um, it's most of the time kit built. Uh, Tetrix, Rev, Go Builda, Actobotics. Um, you can use to build a basic push bot and it will work. Um, and it's two motors. So hypothetically, if you need six motors, you can use a push bot and you can use the other six of eight to do whatever you need to do um, as far as um, attachments or assembly wise on your robot. Uh, moving on to a four wheel drive, uh, the four wheel drive is a modified push bot and it has all four wheels powered. So you still have the two traction and two omni wheels, but they're all four driven normally by two motors. So each wheel is ind independently driven. Um, so it has its own power source and torque. Uh, this can be very useful for traversing terrain on the field as well as playing defense. Um, if you use a tank drive with four wheels, the four wheel drive is easily the best option for you. Um, I rank it at a C tier, I don't like a tier list. It's, it's in the middle. Um, it has good acceleration. It can play defense um, competently, I'll say. Um, it does need some weight balance as far as like turning and stuff to be perfectly accurate. Um, it's a fairly simple design. Most of the time it needs to be customly custom built. Um, I have seen some kit built ones, but you start running into issues and it does to be effective. It needs four motors. If you don't use four motors, it's a push bot. It's as bad, if not worse than a push bot because the torque is not just being given to one wheel from the motor. It's being, it's having to be split up over two wheels, which is really, really bad for acceleration. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the four wheel drive, uh, six wheel drive, um, Six wheel drive is very interesting because I think it will be used a lot this year. I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's probably the most popular form of tank drive that we see in FTC. Um, it utilizes four motors, two on either side that drive a center wheel and that are then connected to a traction or omni wheel at each corner um, through either belts, chains, or gears. Um, six wheel drive can be the fastest drivetrain and the most effective at, and be very effective at defense with a proper implementation. I give it a rank of S tier just because of how good it has been in the past and how good it has the potential to be with proper implementation. Um, it has great acceleration, great defense. Um, it has a center pivot point, which is perfect. Um, you do kind of need a design plan going into it uh, because if you're doing belt or chain or gearing, it's gonna be a lot of figuring stuff out. You don't have to buy stuff 20 times to make it work. Um, it can be custom or kit built and it does need four motors. Please do not use one motor on a six wheel drive. You're then just splitting the torque of that motor over instead of two wheels on the, on the four or on the four wheel drive, you're splitting the torque from that one motor over three wheels on either side, which is not a good idea at all. Um, a lot of issues can arise from doing stuff like that. Um, so we'll move on to the eight wheel drive. Um, it's probably the most powerful form of tank drive that has been made so far. It's very similar to the six wheel drive as far as design, but it needs a center drop of the two center wheels more often than not. And a good eight wheel drive design should be able to play defense against any FTC robot that it can that it faces in a match. Um, except maybe maybe tank drive or the tread drive, you could run into some issues playing defense against them, but it would be a very very even match. Um, 
a good eight wheel drive also um, should have once again two motors because you don't want to divide one motor up um, among four wheels on either side. Um, it has good acceleration. It has the best defense. It can turn slowly and be kind of sluggish when turning. So that's my issue with this eight wheel drive is just the sluggishness of turning. Um, it does need some sort of design plan when you go into it, as far as um, design wise and how you're gonna um, do power transfer from motors to the wheels. 99% um, of the time I'd say it's custom. I don't really see that many eight wheel drives that are kit built. It's probably possible, but I wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend just custom building it. And it does need four motors. Don't use two motors on an eight wheel drive. That's a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. Um, so that's eight wheel drive, very similar to six wheel drive. I recommend six wheel drive over eight wheel drive. Um, moving on to the tread drive. Um, this is where one of the, it gets kind of interesting because this season with the terrain that you have to cross to, to pick up the uh, cargo in the warehouse, um, I think tread drive will be used by more teams than it has ever been. It's an interesting concept um, in theory, but in practice it falls flat. I, wanna, I don't want to say flat on its face because it has been implemented semi-successfully, but a tread drive requires a ton of research and development to be effective. And even with all that research and development it is prone to failure um, because if you have your treads hit, they could be knocked off track, um, broken, or a ton of stuff can happen. There's a ton of points of failure, which we try to limit um, in mechanical design. And I personally would avoid it. Some teams are going to use it. Some teams are going to be probably be successful with it, but it all depends on what sort of development they can put into their drivetrain. And how effectively they can mitigate risks from braking. Um, tread drive does have a low top speed. Um, it has the best traction. It's fragile against defense. You have to have a design plan. It's going to be custom. You're not going to prob you're probably not going to be able to build a kit tank drive that easily. Um, and it needs four motors. So moving on to holonomic drives and a holonomic drive is different from tank drive as it is able to not only move forward and backwards, but it's also able to move side to side. Um, it's, there are five common types of drive tank of drives that are used that make up 99% of the holonomic drives that we see. Um, that would be the mechanism, X drive, H drive, swerve drive, and differential swerve drive. Um, so if we move on to the first one, that's going to be mechanism drive. Um, I'd personally say that mechanism drive is probably the most popular in FTC. Most teams use it and most teams are very, very successful with it. Um, the way mechanism drivetrains work is you have special wheels um, that each have um, angled rollers. And these rollers, um, when you spin the wheel, turn and they create a force vector. And those vectors are then um, with the four wheels are all put together and are able to translate and make the robot move in the direction you want. Um, another big upside to mechanism drivetrain is you can build a very, very, very solid drivetrain using kit parts, um, such as gluten-free and their robots that they have won world championships with. Um, they used um, Actobotics. Um, my team does use the mechanism drive. Uh, we think it's, personally think it's the best. We're gonna look at possibly switching this year, depending on how stuff goes. Um, it's an S tier for me because of its effectiveness, um, it has good acceleration. It's, it, it can play defense. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, with proper design, it can play defense competently. I'll say it's not gonna be a six wheel drive or an eight wheel drive playing defense. Um, it does have that center pivot point, which again is really, really good. Um, strafing is sl slightly slower than driving forward because you do run the risk of, uh, or not run the risk, but you just have the difference as the vectors are slightly more powerful in the forward direction than they're in the side to side direction. Uh, it can be customer kit built and you have to have four motors to run mechanism drive. You cannot run it with two. You have to have four, otherwise the wheels and the force vectors, the way they're supposed to work, won't work properly. Um, moving on to the X drive. The X drive used to be quite a bit more common in FTC. 
um, than it is now. Uh, but over the years, just usage of it has just dropped off um, because what we've seen with mechanum wheels becoming so good. Um, if you need an X drive, a work probably would work. An X drive would probably work to an extent, but the lack of traction um, because you have omni wheels in four corners is a huge problem. If you were playing against any sort of defensive robot that's not an X drive, uh, because they are going to be able to push you around really easily. Um, so basically. Basic rule, rule is for X-Drive, if you have the money, go Mechanum. Um, it's a C tier um, because it's been very effective in the past, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it has poor acceleration. It cannot play defense at all, really. Um, it has a center, center pivot point, so that's nice. But its strafing is not great, and it requires – it can be custom or kit built, and it requires four motors. I've some seen some – concepts of a two wheel or a two motor X drive, but that just scares me um, as far as building that and getting that to work. And torque wise, you're already limited on traction and you have poor acceleration and you're just making it even worse. So I don't recommend doing a two motor X drive at all. Uh, moving on to the H drive. So the H drive is one of the special holonomic drive trains because it has the capabilities of strafing, which makes it holonomic, but it has the properties of a tank drive, um, uh, specifically either a four or six wheel drive. Um, the H drive uses a tank drive layout um, with its wheels plus an added center um, omni wheel or um, grip wheel that allows it to strafe side to side. Um, it you do need a bunch of planning, and sometimes you need custom suspension for that center wheel to work properly. Um, but it can work really, really. It can work. I want to say really well, but it can work well if you implement it correctly. Um, you have good acceleration, uh, great defense because you have those properties of the tank drive. It is a very complex design. Strafing isn't great. It can be customer kit built, and it's got three or five motors. For me, it's a B tier. It's not perfect. There's a lot to be asked of it that you could add. It would be much better. And it's just, it's somewhere in the middle. It's not terrible, but it's not super, super good. Uh, so moving on to a swerve drive. So swerve drive is commonly found in FRC. We don't see them that much in FTC because of our limits on motor usage. We can only have eight motors plus 12 servos. And a swerve drive would either take all eight motors or four motors and four servos. And I have seen swerve drive, drive designs that have been made using um, servos, but innovation is gonna be needed as far as those designs go um, to make swerve drives one of the best drivetrains you can use as the time that it takes to turn the actual wheels so you can go move side to side needs to be cut down. And right now we don't have any servos that are have enough torque and can move fast enough to do that. So um, that's, that's kind of that. It has great acceleration, plays great defense, basically four-wheel drive defense. There is strafe lag, which is what I was talking about, where you have to turn the wheels. Um, it has the fastest strafing out of any drive, holonomic drivetrain. Um, it's going to be full custom. You can't really kit build a sort of drive. It's very hard to do. It's Theoretically, it's possible, but it would be very, very complex and probably wouldn't be as good as anywhere near as good as a custom one would be. And it is does require four motors. So the differential swerve drive is interesting because it is probably the best holonomic drivetrain besides the mechanism drive, um, objectively speaking. Um, the motors are connected to, um, to two drive gears, basically that spin opposite of each other. And then there's a wheel in the center, um, which you can see in these pictures is the gray wheel. Um, that is on a differential. And so as those bevel gears that are connected to the drive motors spin, um, it can spin the wheel. And while that wheel is spinning, you can also turn the wheel based off uh, by varying the speed um, of the top or bottom gear. Um, with a proper implementation, a, a differential swerve drive is good. It's not going to be as good as a mechanism as far as just ease of use, but it's good. I give it an A tier because of some of the promise I've seen with it. 
has great acceleration. It can play good defense. It doesn't need servos compared to the regular sort of drive. It has fast strafing. Um, it does have to be custom. If anything, this uh, differential swerve is, it does require custom parts. It'd be very, very, very hard to do um, without um, machining or 3D printing something. Um, and it does need four motors because it needs to, to power each wheel. Uh, so trying to decide which drive platform to use, it's a complicated process because you need to take into consideration what your team strengths are, what your strategy is, and how the game is built for the season. Um, so because the drive train is the foundation of your robot, if it's subpar, you could limit your scoring capabilities and kind of limit yourself um, when competing. So the, here are a few of the things, I'm just gonna make a list of things that can influence what drivetrain you use. So if you wanna play defense, um, use a six wheel drive, an eight wheel drive or a swerve drive. And it's hard to put a swerve drive in there because of just some of the issues with it as far as torque um, of the, for the servos. Um, does the game require precise movement? If it requires precise usement, movement, I'd use a mechanism drive. Um, such as in Skystone, where you had to place the blocks on top of each other uh, very precisely. Um, Mechanum was easily the best for that. If you can make custom parts, I'd look into doing one of the swerve drives as an off-season project. And if you get good with those good results, possibly use it in a season. Um, if you need to be as fast as possible, use a six-wheel drive. It's simple as that. Use a six-wheel drive if you need to be fast. Um, if your team is limited to four motors overall in your entire robot, say you're just using like one, like a base kit and one expansion hub or control hub, um, you can't use the expansion hub and control hub or two expansion hubs. You can only use one. Um, look into an H drive or the push bot. Um, they're both options that can work. But if you have the money, just get an extra expansion hub so you can have eight motors and you can be faster and use much, much, much more competitive drivetrains. Um, if you need an easy drivetrain to build, look into the mechanism or six wheel drive. Um, as far as complexity goes, those are like your best, best bang for the buck value as far as design time that you put into it. Um, if the game has terrain, I would look into, personally would look into a four wheel drive or a six wheel or six wheel drive can work, but mostly four wheel drive or a swerve drive. Um, so that's quite interesting this year because we do see terrain, the return of terrain on the field. Um, and if you have the development time and money for a complex drivetrain, if so, I'd look at a custom mechanism or six wheel drive or differential swerve just because of there's so many upsides to those drivetrains um, that makes, they're so good. Um, I would definitely look into using those. So when you're choosing between a custom or kit drivetrain, um, there are like the two main options. A custom drivetrain is going to have two plates and um, wheels and belts and or gears or chain uh, powered by the motors. A kit drivetrain is going to be made using channel or extrusion. Um, both are very competitive. And both of the pictures on these slides, so the one on the left, that's a design for our team's robot for this year. Um, this is, I think, in version two. We're on version three right now. And the one on the right is our drive train from last year. That was version, I think, 14.2. 14 14 and so we got up to 14.6, I think. Um, we just switched out a few bits on that. So those are, they both worked very well for us last year. And when we go and look at designing a kit drivetrain, um, you need to like test and prototype different designs. Um, and from those tests, you would choose what it's the best design to build a drivetrain. But a year or two ago, Go Builder released their Strafer chassis, and then they released their six wheel beeline drive last year. And so both of these drivetrains are extremely um, competitive and complete, and they show a solid design that, if needed, you can buy it as a complete kit and use that with the peace of mind, knowing that it's probably not going to, there's not going to be any major issues. Um, the kit drivetrain can still be built with other parts, but it could have issues that go build a kits um, have already um, ironed out that um, you could run into. Um, how to design a custom mechanism drivetrain. So 
this is the point of the video where I'm kind of going to switch from what are the types and a lot more of like choosing a type of drivetrain to more of designing a custom drivetrain. So I, I'm going to be doing how to design a custom mechanism drive because I have the most CAD resources and other materials for that. Um, but when designing a custom drivetrain, there is a process that you have to follow. And I've kind of just made here a list of the process. Uh, first, you've got to design a sketch of the side view, the drive pod with all standoffs, axles, mounting points, motors, and belt lengths. Um, then you have to create a final sketch of the inner and outer plates, pocketing if your material allows for it. So you can't pocket carbon fiber, that'll lose its strength. Um, you then need to create wheel and motor assemblies so that they fit into the specified mounting points. Assemble all of your parts in the one designed for each of the two drive pods. And then you need to measure the width of each pod and figure out how um, long a cross beam you can have. And then choose which cross beam you want. And then assemble your drivetrain and see what it looks like when you're completed if you're happy with it. So to design a layout sketch, um, you have to lay out um, where your wheels and axles are gonna go. Um, if, if you're gonna have a top plate, um, you need a spot to put top plate mounts. Um, you need to have a spot for your motors and motor mounts to go. Um, support, stand, support standoffs, um, such as like just wherever there's like some weakness, you can put um, support there. And then your odometry pods and mounts for mounting odometry to the drivetrain. Um, so that's kind of the first step. Um, the next step is to create a final sketch of the plates. Um, to do that, um, take the primary sketch and like graph out where the, or not graph, draw and sketch out where the holes for everywhere, all the holes you want to be in the final um, product. And then what you need to do is, um, if you want to, you can um, either put in mounting points like I did here in this um, and or pocket the plate. So I kind of did a combination of both. I put a bunch of mounting points and then I pocketed each uh, end where kind of the wheel goes um, just to save on some weight. And you can only pocket really if you're using aluminums or steel um, as it will save lots of weight. It's not as much worth it if you're gonna do like, like uh, Dorlin or polycarbonate, though it can still be useful. And just remember, reminder, you can't pocket carbon fiber because it will lose its strength because of those interwoven fibers. Um, they do, continuous fibers, you get that taken away and you lose strength. So to design wheel assemblies, you have to choose whether you're using a dead axle or live axle setup. So for this example, I'm gonna be using a dead axle setup because it's what I have. CAD for, and I personally think it's the best. To make a dead axle wheel assembly, uh, what you have to do first is connect the wheel and pulley that you're going to be using with a 3D printed custom spacer uh, made with PLA, ABS, PETG, or similar material. I use PLA. Um, I might reprint with PETG just to make it a little bit stronger. And then you're going to want to measure from distance from one side of the pulley to the other side of the wheel. And this allows you to, um, when you take the measurement, you can choose an axle that fits. And to choose an axle, um, I chose 56 millimeters because it would work. And then you can put um, bearings on either side of the wheel and pulley and just um, have that sit right on the axle. Um, when we move on to designing the motor mount, um, we have to, uh, we need a strong design as the torque from the motor could cause slippage in the system, especially if you're using belts. Um, you need to pay attention to the spacing that you have in your primary sketch with your wheel and motors because that center to center distance that you had with your chain, belt, or gears is very important. You need to keep that. And so what I do is I take the motors and I fa face mount them to a um, custom plate um, that I cut normally out of like 6061 aluminum or even steel. Um, and then I attach standoffs to that plate and that allows it to um, uh, just be like inside the pod a little bit. It saves space in the center of the robot. So you can say so you have like odometry in the middle or have, and then you have the belts on the very outside of the um, drive pod. Uh, 
to then start assembling the drive pods, um, you need a, it's first assembly. It's kind of a test to make sure everything fits together. Um, if you find a, that you have a part that doesn't quite fit, go back to the through the CAD and change the parts that you need to change so everything works properly. Um, if you've made it the drivetrain pod and everything fits together, um, you can go through and start final assembly um, of the drivetrain. Um, so that's just kind of just, it's just a final test before you manufacture anything. Um, to what you need next is you need to choose a cross beam. So choose a cross beam. Uh, you need to basically have a cross beam that pushes the, the very edge of each of your drive pods far enough apart. So you're at about 17 and a half inches. And 17 and a half inches is like a good ballpark number that you want to aim for because of um, tolerances with the sizing tool that they'll use in inspection. Um, it's just nice to have that little bit of extra um, leeway in case there's some sort of issue. Um, you'll be good. Um, and by using rev extrusion or other extrusions such as Mizumi, um, you can cut cross beams to the correct length that you need them to be. And this takes out any sort of air and you can push it right up to 17 and a half inches. But if you're using channel um, for a channel based a cross beam, um, you need to find a piece that fits, which can be harder to do. Um, but what I have found is GoBuilder has the best selection of channel lengths. Um, they have, I think, them in increments of 24 millimeters. So that can be really, really useful just because you have a lot more options um, as far as like design goes. And it's just a lot easier to use when you have the peace of mind that it's going to work and it can be a lot stronger. So to assemble the full drivetrain, um, you just connect the two drive pods uh, with the cross beams. So that's just kind of like assemb assembly is fairly simple for the last step. Um, so this has kind of been a process um, for what I use to make custom drivetrains for my team. Um, it's not going to work exactly for everyone, um, the process I've described here, but it is a generalized outline um, for like kind of something to follow. And I hope you can modify like kind of what I do um, to fit the way your team does stuff or the way um, uh, it works best for you. Um, so just a little presentation summary. Um, drive trains, I do recommend six wheel drive and mechanism. Those are the two I recommend the most. Other things can work, but in the end, six wheel drive and mechanism are the best for FTC from what I've found and from what others have found. Um, the process for making a custom drivetrain is sign a, a sketch of the side view of the drive pod, create the final sketch of the inner and outer plates, create the wheel and motor assemblies, assemble all the parts into one design for each of two drive pods, figure out how long of a cross beam you use, and assemble the final drivetrain. So that's like that's basically that's basic basic summary of um, the entire presentation. Um, so my contact info. Um, if you have any issues or questions about designing your own drivetrain, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, here's my Discord and my email. Um, just send me a message. I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I do have school, so I won't be able to answer right as you send it, but I'll try to get back to you within 24 hours with anything that you really need drivetrain-wise or design-wise. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this breakout session and that you've learned something that you can apply to your robots to make them even better um, this season. And I'm looking forward to seeing everyone um, and their robots uh, at competitions this year. And yeah. So now that we're done with this, um, the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so that way I can try to answer them. And just any questions, comments, concerns, um, mostly questions, uh, because that way, if anyone has a question, um, if, if you're not sure, ask it. There's no, such thing. There's no such thing as bad questions, only bad answers is um, what I've been taught. Um, is it possible for a six-wheel mechanism drivetrain, and is there a benefit for it? Um, so I'm thinking right off the top of my head, um, I was actually thinking about this earlier today when kickoff released. It would, hypothetically, I think it would be possible to have... Um, two mechanism wheels on either end, and then a center omni wheel. Um, and that omni wheel would have to be either powered by some sort of like, like a, maybe a differential 
or a um like the motor that um that you have powering once uh one of the uh wheels so just like connect that wheel to the motor as well um what i have seen work is uh eight wheel drive mechanism um that's a complex design and it's a lot of mechanism wheels and there's not really that much of a um application for it but it does um i mean it, it could provide better terrain crossing um that's what i can think of off the top of my head but I don't see a crazy gain for a six wheel mechanism drive. Um, if you're, if you need six wheel drive, I'd recommend going with just a, a pl plain regular um, six wheel drive um, because of the extra traction that you have with it. So, yeah, but that's a really good question. Uh, that's actually, 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 that's something that'll be really interesting to actually try to design and figure out. So does anybody else have any questions? If not, um, this is the end of the, end of the breakout session, so you can leave. Um, if you don't have any questions, I'll just stick in here till three o'clock, just in case. Um, so, yeah, just once again, any questions, put it in the chat or turn on your mic and you can ask me the question. I should be able to answer it um, to some extent. Um, like I say, only there's only uh, no such thing as a bad question, only a bad answer. So that's what that's what I've learned. <laughs>